Good morning, church. So it's, I'm in sixth grade, and I'm standing in a basketball gym, and I have my hand raised, hoping that the legendary shooting whisperer coach will call on me to demonstrate. I'm in sixth grade, I'm about 4'8". <clears throat> Why are you laughing? It is a fear of mine that I might not ever be able to dunk. So I am at this particular basketball clinic because this coach is supposed to be able to teach anybody how to shoot. And at 4'8", I might need that skill. And so I've got my hand raised, and, and it's the third day of the clinic. The first day of the clinic was all about dribbling, and I'm just like, okay. All right, I got it. Yeah, I can do it. The V-dribble, I got it. Okay, good. And I'm just waiting for us to get to the shooting portion because this is what the coach is known for. And the second day, all we do is defense all day long. And it just feels like all day. Defense, okay, I got it. I got it. When are we going to get to the shooting? And finally, the third day comes, and he says, I need someone to demonstrate. I raise my hand. Oh, I'm ready. And he calls on me. And I go to the front of the pack, and he says, all right, what's your name? I said, it's David. He said, okay, I want you to shoot. And I look where we are, and we're like a step behind the free throw line. And it's like <clears throat> at the limit of my range at that point. I'm a little bit nervous. But he says, I want you to shoot it, but I want you to miss. And I was like, okay. But I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it on accident. And so I miss it. And... And then he says, okay, I'll bet you, you were looking at the front of the rim because you missed short. And I was like, yeah, that's why. And he said, our eyes are very important in basketball. Our eyes are very important when we're shooting. Our eyes tell the ball where to go. So I want you to look at the back of the rim. What do you think happened? I missed it long, <laughs> but I missed it long, and I learned an important lesson that day as I heard him say, wow, that usually works. Uh, I learned that he was right, that our eyes determine a lot, and where we look often determines our future. Our vision often determines what we become affectionate over. What our emotions become connected to, our vision often determines our destinations. So what are you looking for this Easter? What are you looking at? How is what you are looking for, what you are looking at, what are you looking after, how is that affecting how you come to the resurrection of Jesus this morning? I think we tend to look at Easter in one of two ways. Some of us look at Easter by looking backwards. It's an event that happened in the past, an important event that happened in the past that has brought us to a good present. In that way, it's kind of like a celebration like the 4th of July. Somebody did something a long time ago that was really good and brave and it created for us the lives that we live in and that we're grateful for. And so like the 4th of July, we celebrate this historical event by recreating in obvious ways those historical events. So we light fireworks, which makes total sense. And we look for Easter eggs that have been brought to us by an animal that does not lay eggs. <laughs> which makes total sense. We tend to look at Easter backwards. And when we look at it backwards, we can feel gratitude. And that's good. We should be grateful for this morning and all that it means. We also tend to look at Easter forward and the reality that it can bring us 
in the future. Specifically, we look at how Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection gives us hope as we day to day, I hate to tell you, near our deaths. As we encounter deaths of loved ones, we don't grieve with those who have no hope. We don't grieve as those who have no hope. We, we grieve in hope because we believe we'll see them one day. And we have peace as we approach our inevitable deaths because we know that the God who was faithful to the Son will be faithful to all of his children. And it is good for us to look at Easter forward and to feel peace. It's just that is not where it seems. Either of those places did not seem where the gospel writer Matthew this morning would have us look. Matthew tells us a couple of details that happened uh, in the previous chapter that are really important. The first is that as Jesus is being brought down off the cross, as, as Friday comes to a close, Joseph of Arimathea goes to Pilate. And Pilate, the Roman governor of the area, he, he asks Pilate if he can bury the body. And Pilate is already showing like disinterest in this whole thing. And so he says, sure, I don't care, take him. Joseph of Arimathea goes and takes Jesus' body to a brand new tomb that he has made specifically for this as a secret follower of Jesus. And two women, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they sit opposite of the tomb and watch Joseph of Arimathea, the secret apostle, the secret disciple, wrap his body in linen and anoint his body with oil and spices, preparing it for burial. This is important on a couple of levels. It is important that these brave women are there witnessing this because where are all of the other followers? Where is Peter and James and John? They're not there to witness it. Mary and the other Mary are there bravely demonstrating that they are still followers of this man. And witnessing a burial is very important in that culture. It's important for religious reasons. You need to see the body all the way to the tomb. Jewish people still practice this. But it's important for another reason that brings us to the next detail that Matthew tells us is very important. The Jewish council is afraid of grave robbers. They are afraid of what the followers of Jesus might say happened because they themselves have gone to Pilate and have said, Pilate, we need some of your strong Roman soldiers to guard the tomb. Lest the followers of this man, who they are now calling the imposter, lest the followers of the imposter come and take his body and the second deception is worse than the first. And Pilate, again, disinterested, is like, you've got guards. Send your own guards. And so the Jewish council sends what we would assume would be their two strongest, bravest guards because this imposter has so worked his way into their minds and their psyches that they are afraid of any sort of violence that might occur, any sort of bravery that might rise up from his followers if it seems as though his death were itself a lie. They still think Jesus has come to bring a kingdom of violent insurrection. They still think that that is the kind of kingdom that Jesus, who did not correct people when, he, when they called him the king of the Jews, he, they still think that is the kind of kingdom he is after. And so the guards watch as the tomb is covered with a heavy stone, and Mary and Mary watch as the tomb rolls over, and it turns to Sabbath. Mary and Mary, they, they go back home, and they rest on the Sabbath day, and as dawn is rising, as the sun is rising in the east, 
Mary and Mary are the first to go and notice what it says. To go see his tomb. Matthew's already drawing our attention to the visual. It doesn't say that they have any plans of robbing the grave. It certainly don't have any plans of overpowering the soldiers and rolling the heavy stone away. They just want to go look at the grave of their leader, of their teacher, of their beloved. But when they get there, that's when the weird things start to happen. When they get there, there's an earthquake. And it seems like the earthquake is being caused by this thing that is coming out of the sky. They look up. Their attention is drawn to something coming out of the sky. And it is an angel of the Lord, a man whose clothing is as white as snow and whose body and face shine like a lightning strike. And as he descends, it's like the earth starts shaking and the stone itself starts rolling away. And the man sits on the stone. And now we should not catch the irony as our attention is brought back to the brave, strong soldiers. They have shifted. Those who have come to guard the dead outside the tomb are now so scared that they are acting as though they are dead. And the angel turns to Mary and Mary and says, I know what you have come here to see. You are looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He has risen. And then the angel says, Come look where he lay. Come witness this. Have we noticed all of the times that Matthew, the narrator, is causing us to look, to look, to look? It is good to look backwards and to see an empty spot where Jesus lay. But the looking does not stop there. Twice more in this story... Our modern English translations translate it to something else like suddenly or, or hurry. But twice more, the verb for to look becomes a command. And a more little translation becomes something like this. Look here. Look here. The angel says to Mary and the other Mary, look here. Go and tell the other disciples quickly. And then on the road, they encounter Jesus as they are looking. They see him. And Jesus says to them, this is my favorite part. Hey, it's almost untranslatable, but, but what we see is it's the most common greeting in the language. Jesus, risen from the dead, rolling the stem away, miraculously rising, and looks at them and says, hey guys. And they grab his feet, lest he run away again. And they worship him. And then Jesus says, look here. It is me. Go tell my other brothers and sisters to go to Galilee, where I am heading, and they will see me. Matthew is begging us to look. Look at the spot where he lay. It is good to be grateful that that spot is empty, to look backwards. And go look in Galilee, the common places where the, every person lives. Not the holy city, not the kingly city, not the city of prestige. Jesus is headed to the common places where you and I live, and we can look forward to seeing him there. We can look forward to encountering the resurrected Jesus in our futures. And we can feel grateful for the peace we will feel when we encounter the resurrection in the future. But let's not forget that those are not our only two options. It is so good for us to be grateful for what has happened. It is so good for us to feel hope and peace about looking forward to what it will one day mean. But church, we must keep 
looking for Jesus in the future, in the present, in our right now. Look, look, look for Jesus, Matthew says. Because it seems we would expect when we look to see him, to see resurrection itself, and so be changed. The emotions that everyone is feeling in this are not emotions of past, like gratitude. And they're not emotions of future, like worry or anxiety or peace. They are emotions that lock us into the present. The soldiers are so afraid that they seize up with fear and act like dead people. Mary and the other Mary begin with fear, which is a present tense emotion. But when the angel sends them on their way and they begin looking for Jesus, they feel fear mixed with great joy. What does that feel like? I imagine that fear mixed with great joy might be the, one of the most present feeling emotions one could ever experience. Church, your need to experience the resurrection, your ability to experience the resurrection, it absolutely exists in our pasts. It absolutely exists in our futures, but it must also exist in our right now. If the resurrection is not something you have experienced in the living, in the following of Jesus in the right here and the right now, we can work on that. There are things that we can do. Because Jesus shows up to two brave women who are the first witnesses and become the first gospel evangelists. And they are willing to look for him anywhere. And when they see him, they are mixed with fear and great joy. And I hope the resurrection of Jesus can push us to places where in our day-to-day lives we are looking for and thus experiencing the resurrection of Jesus. The reality of this story is that Jesus has not only acted in the past and Jesus is not only our hope for the future, but Jesus is in our right now. And the resurrection is for you right now. I have not always known what that meant. But I would like to share with you some ways that my mind has matured and my actions have matured and I have moved from knowledge and awareness to prioritizing the ability to experience resurrection right now. I want us to start with a a definition. Here's what I think Here's what I think a helpful definition of resurrection is. Resurrection is when God lovingly returns to life those who have willingly embraced death. It is a difficult truth that a death must precede resurrection. Jesus tells his followers earlier in Matthew, those that will follow me must take up their crosses and follow me daily. A cross must precede resurrection new life. But we can trust God to let ourselves surrender ourselves, to have these little deaths every day, to lose ourselves to the gospel of Jesus because we can trust that the God who loved Jesus out of that grave will love us out of our deaths. We can do it. Here are two ways I have found that we can experience the resurrection right here and right now. The first way that we can look for the resurrection in our day-to-day is habits of surrender. Habits of surrender. For me, habits of surrender, the, the habit of surrender that I most often practice, most reliably brings me to a place of my own death, is silence and solitude. In silence and solitude, there is no one I could possibly impress. There is no mask I could wear that would convince God I am something other than who I am. In silence and solitude, as the psalmist says, God searches me and knows me completely. And I die in silence and solitude. Often I experience a strange, 
breaking of my own heart. I can't explain it. Often I experience tears. And I'm not necessarily sad about anything other than that it feels as though I am dying. But that that feels good. It's a mixture of fear and great joy. And in that moment where I feel myself dying, I often find right behind it a kind of peaceful serenity that I would just describe as resurrection. A lovingly return to life from where I had died. Other forms of habits of surrender are things like Sabbath, where you can't earn the love of God. You have to rest and receive it. Fasting is a great form of surrender because we can't feed ourselves into God's love. We can't purchase our way into feeling resurrection. We have to die a little bit to experience the resurrection. The second habit that I would encourage, the second area of habits I would encourage us to look for for experiencing the resurrection are habits of community. In Christian community, in true Christian community, where it's safe enough to take off the mask of perfection, to put down the burden of achievement and approval, and to let another Christ follower see who you really are, is a form of death. You cannot keep living your false self and let someone see your true self. But when that person says, I see you for you and I'm not going anywhere, that's resurrection. That is a life brought lovingly back from death. And so now we turn to this table, which is both a habit of surrender and Christian community. This is sometimes ironically maybe the most important part of our Easter gathering. This table causes us to surrender. Jesus, even before he knew, before before the cross was on his back, Jesus could have chosen anything, any practice, for us to know him more. And he chose a feast table. And at this table, we have to surrender. You can't bring your prejudices here. If you bring your prejudice here, you might look up at your spot reserved for you and see the very person you least like to see. They're invited too. You can't bring your pride or your achievement because you didn't earn your spot at this table. You are invited because of who Jesus is. You have to drop all of your false self to come to this table. But this table is a table of community. I have heard more people be convinced of the love of a Christian community because they were invited to a welcome spot at a table than almost any act of service, any good preaching or teaching. It is the invitation, the honest invitation to be in community, to be seen and known and not rejected, but loved deeply for who you are that convinces people there is a God who loves them unconditionally. It is quite hard to believe in the unconditional love of God when God's own people don't want you around. But fortunately, we don't own this table. Our presence here is because we have surrendered to Jesus. And at this table of surrender, you are welcome. At the table of Jesus, the pre-cross table of Jesus. Can you look? Can you see resurrection right now? I hope 
you walked in this morning and you felt welcomed. I hoped you were greeted. I hoped you were hugged. And I hope you know that right now at this table, you are shoulder to shoulder with us, with Jesus as our host, and we are glad you are here because of the resurrection, because it is right here and right now. And so church, take. This is the body of Christ broken for you and healed again. And church, take. This is the blood of Christ poured out for you, but risen and now given to us. Take and drink. And would you stand and receive a blessing as the worship team comes forward? May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you into the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to these doors.